thanks to Mark Goreski and the rest of the organizers for the invitation. Uh, so I'm going to tell you today about two isosiahedra. And the rough plan is uh, I'll start by giving a sketch definition of the Fukaya category of a symplectic manifold and how that relates to uh, well-known spaces called the isosiahedra. Um, I'll tell you how um, building maps between Fukaya categories requires or suggests using new spaces called two isosiahedra. Um, I'll tell you about the construction of the two isosiahedra, denoted W n bar. Um, I'll talk about the combinatorics of these things, so the post set of strata um, and how you can manipulate them. Um, and then if I have time, I'll tell you about the operad-like structure on the two isosiahedra. Um, and my aim is that the whole talk will be understandable to everyone. We'll see if I can do that. So if, if you stop understanding, then please say something. OK. So the Fukaya, or no, let's start off even more basic than the Fukaya category. Let's start off with the definition of a symplectic manifold. So um, a symplectic manifold is a smooth, even dimensional manifold, M, together with omega, where omega is a two form, which is closed, and whose top wedge power is non degenerate. So the top wedge power is a volume form. Um, so the simplest case is when n is equal to 1, and then it's just a real surface together with an area form. OK. Um, now, there's a distinguished sort of subvariety of a symplectic manifold called a Lagrangian submanifold. And a Lagrangian, what I'm going to mean by that in this talk is an n dimensional submanifold of a two n dimensional symplectic manifold with the property that the restriction of omega to this submanifold vanishes. So, in the case that n is equal to 1, that's just the same thing as a curve inside of our real surface. Um, and um, if you understand the Lagrangians in a given symplectic manifold, then you really know uh, a whole lot about that symplectic manifold. So understanding the Lagrangians is really important. Um, now, there's this. Uh, there's this object that you can associate in good circumstances to a symplectic manifold, which is called the Fukaya category. So you should think of this as an algebraic invariant. Um, and to zeroth order, you should think of this Fukaya category as giving uh, an intersection theory of Lagrangians inside of this particular M, which is um, robust to certain symplectic transformations. Um, OK, so let me give you a sketch definition of this Fukaya category, and this is uh, a simplified definition, but it's going to be enough for the purposes of this talk. So as the name suggests, it's something like a category. Um, so what does a category have? It has objects and morphisms and a composition operation. So the objects of the Fukai category of M are um, the Lagrangians inside of M, or some subcollection. Now, if I have two Lagrangians, what are the space of what's the space of morphisms? Well, it's just defined to be formal linear combinations of intersection points. In the generic case, when these two Lagrangians intersect transversely, and therefore their set of intersection points is discrete. OK, and finally, we need a composition operation. Um, so we need 
a map which takes in uh, a morphism from L0 to L1, and a morphism from L1 to L2, and spits out a morphism from L0 to L2. Uh, and at first glance, you know, it's really not at all obvious how in the world you'd produce such a map. Um, so the way that you do this is you, um, you inject some complex geometry, or almost complex geometry. So um, to build this map, and let's call this composition operation mu2, we're going to fix an almost complex structure on M. So that's J, an endomorphism of the tangent bundle with J squared is equal to negative 1. And we want it to be compatible with the symplectic form in the sense that when we contract omega with j, we get a Riemannian metric. OK, so now that we've fixed this almost complex structure, and you can always do so, and there's a unique way up to homotopy of doing so, um, we can define our composition operation. and. Uh, in words, we're going to define this composition operation by counting disks inside of M, which are pseudo-holomorphic with respect to this almost complex structure. So say that we feed in uh, x1 an intersection of L0 and L1, and x2 intersection of L1 and L2. And we need to spit out a linear combination of intersections of L0 and L2. So we need to know the coefficient on some particular intersection of L0 and L2. <laughs> so how are we going to do this? Let's start off by um, kind of precisely defining what I mean by a pseudo-holomorphic disk involving all these objects. Um, and I'll denote this boundary value problem pictorially. So here's a disk with three punctures. One of the punctures is distinguished, so I am going to always denote the distinguished puncture by this hollow dot. Um, I'll label the interior by M, the three, the three components of the boundary by the three Lagrangians in question, and the three punctures by x1, x2, and y, where y is what we're looking for the coefficient on. So when I, when I draw this set, what I mean is the collection of all pseudo-holomorphic maps from this thrice punctured disk to M, which are pseudo-holomorphic with respect to the standard complex structure on the disk and the almost complex structure we've fixed on M, um, which satisfies boundary conditions in L0, L1, and L2, and which is asymptotic at the punctures to X1, X2, and Y. Now I'll quotient out by um, precomposition with isomorphisms of the domain. Um, there is some natural stratification of this moduli space. So we're going to only look at the zero-dimensional part. And so at this point, we've cooked up some moduli space with, uh, as it turns out, finitely many points. And we're just going to count that. And that's the coefficient on y. Any questions about that? Uh, no, I don't quite understand that. <laughs> so, so what are these, these disks are? Is this well defined, first of all? Um, yes. Okay. W what do you have in mind when you ask whether it's well, well defined? I mean, uh, you could maybe choose different disks, right? Or is that a unique disk? So I'm looking at the collection. So I'm, I'm uh, looking at all thrice punctured disks. Yes. Um, all. Yes, and all maps from any one of those disks to M, which is pseudo-holomorphic and satisfies these incidence conditions. Mm -hmm. And I'm quotienting out by saying that two of these things are um, equivalent if they're the same up to an isomorphism of the domain. So in particular, you talk about the images, which would be some like disk-like things. You're saying there's actually only finitely many disk inside the space. I am, yes, space. yes. And I'm sweeping under the rug issues of transversality. You know, you need to do quite a bit of work if you want to set this up in such a way that you get uh, finite counts which really behave well. But um, except for that, yes, this is well-defined. Yes, but for now I'm just saying fix J ahead of time, and um, and I'm this is just a, a sketch definition. But so it will depend upon J. Yeah. 
these counts will depend upon j, but in a controllable way. A homotopy of j's allows you to do um, some sort of identification of the counts. OK. Um, so super, you know, you might be amazed that we've cooked up some category from the symplectic manifold. There is a big problem, which is that uh, this composition operation is not associative. So mu2, mu2 dot dot comma dot is not equal to mu2 of dot comma mu2 of dot dot. So despite the name, Fuq of M is not a category. Um, so it turns out that we can fix this uh, in a way that produces a well-behaved algebraic object. So the way that we're going to fix this is we're going to mimic the definition of mu2 to produce a whole family of composition operations called mu r, where mu r is an r airy composition. Um, for any r at least 1. Uh, so we just exactly mimic the definition of mu2. except now we're counting maps from r plus 1 times punctured disks. So here's the first one all the way up through the earth, with one of them distinguished. Um, and by doing so, Um, we get this family of R area composition operations. Uh, and um, let me point one thing out that's going to be important in a minute. Um, so like I was saying in my exchange with Tom, uh, we're not going to fix the positions of those R plus 1 marked points on the boundary. So we consider any disk with R plus 1 boundary punctures. Um, now as it turns out, uh, this makes Fuq of M into an infinity category. And you know, don't be scared of the name. All this means is that there's a hierarchy of coherences amongst these operations. Um, and the first few are really easy to wrap your head around. So mu1, that's an endomorphism of HOM from L0 to L1. And it squares to 0. So you can think of mu1 as giving you a differential on uh, HOM from L0 to L1. With respect to this differential, um, mu2 is a chain map. Um, and now this is the next relation is really the one that uh, at least sort of intuitively fixes this problem with associativity. So the two things that failed to be equal, the two different ways of composing mu2 with itself, uh, are equal up to a chain homotopy given by mu3. OK. Um, and, and there's a whole hierarchy of, of coherences. Uh, now, it's not an accident that we have all of these coherences. It's a consequence of the fact that when we defined these composition operations, we were counting maps from punctured disks. Um, and uh, it turns out that the topology of the underlying spaces of domains, so just the spaces of uh, punctured disks, is what's giving rise to this A infinity structure. Um, so for R at least, Let's define um, Kr to be this moduli space of domains. 
So this is disks with r plus 1 boundary punctures, one of them distinguished, up to Mobius transformations. Um, and, and there's nothing symplectic going on here. There's no maps involved. I'm just talking about the disks with boundary mark points. Um, and uh, I won't define exactly how I do this for now, but um, there's a way of compactifying this space. Um, the original space KR was not compact because uh, boundary points can collide. And you don't know what to do then. Um, but we can compactify by um, bubbling off disks that remember the fashion in which collisions took place. Um, and let me illustrate that by an example or two right now. So what's K2? Um, so we're looking at thrice punctured disks, but you can apply a Mobius transformation to take those punctures to 1 minus 1 and i. So that says that there's only one point in K2, or equivalently K2 bar. How about K3 bar? Um, so maybe we'll start out off just with K3, so we won't compactify just yet. Uh, now you can, you can fix three of those boundary mark points to 1 minus 1 and i uh, with the Mobius transformation, but you have one left over. Um, and that one left over mark point can vary between its neighboring mark points. And that tells you that k3 is just a, an interval. So say, for instance, that we fix the positions of the left, right, and bottom mark points. So we only have the top mark point left over. Um, so its position corresponds to where you are on this interval. Um, and the way that we're going to compactify in this case is say that that top mark point hits the left mark point. Um, we're going to add in a point to our moduli space corresponding to that collision. Um, and uh, the way we represent that collision point is by bubbling off a disk at that collision site. So uh, in this limit, you bubble off this disk here. And similarly for the other endpoint. Everyone happy? And now you don't get your ball. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, I won't put too fine a point on it just for now about how exactly the combinatorics and topology of these associahedra, oh, I should say these are called associahedra, um, give rise to the A infinity nature of the Fukaya category. Um, but let me just point out in the case of K3 that the um, the points in the interior are the domains for the maps that we're counting to define mu3. So you can think of the interior as corresponding to mu3. Um, this uh, endpoint here where you have um, these two disks stuck together, well, uh, that looks like the maps that you'd be counting if you're uh, computing the result of sticking mu2 into itself in the second slot. And similarly for the left-hand endpoint. Um, and so it turns out that the structure of K3 is giving rise to one of those relations in this A-infinity hierarchy. Uh, it corresponds to the statement that mu3 is a chain homotopy between these two different ways of composing mu2 with itself. OK. Um, uh, and the name for this sort of structure amongst the associahedra, amongst the KR bars, um, which is uh, in evidence here, where you have uh, the endpoints of K3 looking like sort of uh, two copies of the things that you see labeling K2. That's called an operad structure. Uh, and I'll come back to that later if I have time. OK. Um, great. So uh, let me move on to talking about maps between Fukai categories of different symplectic manifolds. Um, so if you look at the definition of the Fukai category, there's not an obvious notion of functoriality built into it, or baked into it. So there's not an obvious way of relating Fuk of M and Fuk of N for two different symplectic manifolds. Um, Uh, 
Uh, well, um, there's a well-defined notion of a infinity functor, um, but you know, even what should give rise to a functor between Fukai categories of different manifolds is not obvious. Um, you know, you could try uh, building functors out of morphisms that preserve all of the symplectic structure, but that would really not give rise to such an interesting theory. Um, but there was a, a blueprint that Verheim and Woodward proposed in a sequence of uh, five papers with Siki, Medi, Mao on one of them. Uh, and I'll say 2006, but it really took place over a while. So they gave a, a blueprint for how to, how to do this. They said that the object that should give rise to a functor between Fukai categories is a Lagrangian in a product. So they said that if you start out with L01, uh, Lagrangian inside of a product of M0 and M1, with the symplectic form on one of them reversed, then that should give rise to a functor from Fuk of M0 to Fuk of M1. Um, and here's how this blueprint, blueprint works. Um, on the level of Lagrangians, at least for a generic input Lagrangian, we should produce a Lagrangian in the in Fuk of M1, starting with a Lagrangian in M0. Um, and we do so by taking the fiber product of L0 with L01 over M0, and then project the result to M1. Um, and so generically, this gives rise to an immersed Lagrangian in M1. Um, now on the level of morphisms, we'd better have a way of um, of starting with x, a morphism from um, L0 to K0. So these are two Lagrangians in M0. Um, and producing from that a morphism between um, the images of these Lagrangians in M1. Um, and uh, the way that they propose to do this is by counting so-called quilted disks. Um, So like we did when we defined the um, Fukaya category, we're going to count some pseudo-holomorphic objects, but they're a little bit different this time. Um, so here's a disk with one mark point on the boundary, um, actually two mark points on the boundary, and one interior circle, which I'll call a seam, which is tangent to the boundary at the distinguished mark point. Label the two components of the interior by M0 and M1. The seam gets labeled by the correspondence L01. Um, and so this is, this is another, this is representative of another boundary value problem, where this time we're looking for a pair of maps. One map to M0 from this loon, one map from this interior disk to M1, which are both pseudo-holomorphic, and which match up according to Lagrangian correspondence L01 on that seam. So you should feed x into that mark point, and whatever pops out um, at the output at the distinguished mark point, um, that's the image of x under this functor. Um, so, so uh, they realize this blueprint or a version of it in some situations. What do you mean whatever pops out? Are you saying that there will be a unique y for which this exists, and the surface of the thing is by y? No, what I'm saying is. Uh, do the analogous procedure to our definition of mu r. So um, for every uh, y a morphism in the appropriate morphism space in Fuk of M1, um, count quilted disks that are asymptotic to x at this mark point and y at this mark point. And that's going to give you the coefficient of y in the image. OK. Um, so it turns out that this is not the end of the story of functoriality. Um, I'm, I'm not going to tell you exactly why that's the case, but I'll just say it's analogous to knowing mu2 without knowing any of the other mu's. Um, and so something that I proposed uh, partly jointly with Katrin Verheim in 2015 is a way of, of fixing this. So the proposal.
uh, is to is to fix this um, sort of incomplete story of functoriality by counting so-called witch balls, which are um, a family of pseudo-holomorphic quilts, which are uh, more general than the quilted disks that Verheim and Woodward were writing down. So what do these look like? Here's the complex plane. Let's draw a bunch of lines, vertical lines in it, and put mark points on those lines, however many you like. Um, we'll label these R plus 1 patches by symplectic manifolds. Oops. And maybe I won't write this, but the various segments of all of these lines are going to be launching correspondences between the two adjacent symplectic manifolds. Um, uh, and so by the same kind of counting procedure, uh, we'll define a map where the output now is at infinity, and that's going to be a morphism in Fuch of the product of m0 and mr. Um, and this is equivalent just by identifying c with the complement of the south pole in the Riemann sphere with looking at um, quilted spheres, where the seams are r circles, which all intersect tangentially at the south pole. OK, um, and uh, I'm going to say almost nothing more about symplectic manifolds starting now. Uh, I guess the last thing that I'll say about them is um, I'll tell you uh, some of the low R instances of this blueprint. So when R is equal to 1, when you're counting spheres with, with one circle on them, by a folding procedure, that's the same thing as counting disks. Um, so the R equals 1 situation should give rise to um, the standard A infinity structure maps, composition operations on Fook of M0 minus times M1. Um, R equals 2 should give a sort of horizontal composition from Fook of M0 times M1 and Fook of M1 times M2 to Fook of M0 minus times M2 and so forth, with this r equals 2 case specializing to Verheim and Woodward's blueprint, in the case that m0 is a point. OK, um, right. So like I said, no more symplectic stuff. Um, if you're going to try to carry this program out, then maybe step 0 is, OK, verify some uh, of the basic analysis stuff that you would need in order for this to have any chance of succeeding. Um, so that was my thesis. Uh, step 1 is understand, or maybe one candidate for step one is understand the underlying domain moduli spaces. So understand for any choice of r at least one and uh, n and r tuple of non-negative integers not all zero. the moduli space, which I'll call Wn bar of um, configurations of R vertical lines in C with Ni mark points on the ith line. up to translation and dilation. Um, and then there's some compactification procedure that um, I won't specify right now. Um, so this is the analog of the spaces kr bar, which were the domain moduli spaces for um, the composition operations in Fuch. And so these are, these are what's called two associahedra. Um, right, so let me just show you a, a picture of one of these things to, um, you know, show you a little bit of the structure and richness of these spaces. Um, can everyone see this? Okay, so this is W111 bar. 
Um, so this is what happens when we look at spheres with three circles, one marked point on each circle, and one distinguished marked point at the South Pole. Um, and uh, we allow the positions of the lines and the points to vary um, up to translation and dilation. And then we compactify by, uh, by remembering what happens when uh, circles, when seams fuse or marked points come together or both happen simultaneously. Uh, okay, so for instance, um, well, first of all, let me try to say roughly what this space is because I don't know how visible it is. It looks sort of like what happens when you take a dodecagon and cross it with an interval, um, except that four of these, uh, four of the square faces that result have been kind of modified to hexagons. So there are three edges down here. Um, so the four faces that have been modified like that are this one, uh, this one, and this one. Um, and that sort of subdivides the top and the bottom into three faces. Um, so for instance, um, the, the top face right here um, is labeled by this configuration. And so the way that we got there from the interior is the, um, the middle and the left circles collided. And the mark point on the left circle was above the mark point on the middle circle as that collision happened. Um, so the middle and left circles on the main component fused to form this single left circle. Um, two bubbles formed, uh, forced by where the mark points were when that collision happened. And these are those two bubbles. Um, any questions about that? These branching things, even though, say, that one in the lower right hand corner is sort of hard to point, but yeah, the innermost smallest bubble in there, the left branching thing, does that still continue outside of the bubble, or, or do they both do this? Sorry, are, are you talking about one of the bubbles in yes, here? Yes, yes. This that one? one? Yes. On that guy, there's two branchings. Ah, yes, two seams. But are they both going all the way around? Yes. You just, you, with the one on the left, you didn't draw it, or do they come back together? Or? So this little bubble right here, so it's a sphere with two circles on it, which intersect at the South Pole. So yeah, I didn't draw it just because it would look confusing, but the circles go up on the front face, and then they come back down on the back side. So, so these oh, circular objects we yes. can think of as spheres stuck on the sphere, not disks and such disks. That's oh, right. Everything in here that. is uh, trees, of, trees of spheres, each of which has some number of circles, all of which intersect at the South Pole tangentially. Um, and any two spheres if they are meeting at all, are stuck together at a single point. OK. Um, uh, yeah, question. So, at the end, uh, so at the end, is a, I guess there's a limitation on this resistor, what the symplectic manifold can be. It needs to assume so, because otherwise, you can have bubbling off in the interior. So you need, generally, even more general picture where you have additional points running around, which are not like this. Yes, that's true. You're talking about if you need to um, do some kind of stabilization procedure. Yeah, so, 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 so the, the actual picture for the, the most general thing would be even weirder. Than that. That's right. So you need to allow not just marked points on the, on the seams, but also on the patches between seams. Um, and uh, yeah, that interacts in some non-trivial way with the seams and the seam mark points. That's true. Do the bulk, these bulk points give you any kind of L infinity? Uh, well, there's uh, some expected relationship with L infinity stuff, but I really don't want to say anything about that. Curved A infinity. What? Curved A infinity. Curved A infinity. You, su you suppress U0, right? Uh, that's true. Oh, gosh. Huh. Uh, that's interesting. You're saying that there's like a R equals 0 operation that I didn't say anything about. And, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think so. OK, um, super. So uh, let's move on to a few words about the construction of these spaces. Let's see. So I'm going to start out by saying a few words about the construction of the ordinary associahedra, um, the construction of their topological structure. So 
You said obstructed? Um, um, Unobstructed. Oh, with the kind of mark element or something. Then it's phi L01 act on L0. Is that automatically unobstructed? No. Um, well, uh, I should say that uh, there's a sort of preferred more carton element for the image, which is just um, the count of the Verheim Woodward type quilted disks with no seam or boundary mark points. So essentially, the count of figure eight bubbles. It's giving you a more, more equation only for these infinities? Yes. OK. So three, construction of these things. So let's start off with saying a little bit about the construction of, um, of the ordinary associahedra. Um, so, as we saw before, KR is um, the moduli space of configurations of R plus 1 mark points on the boundary of a disk with one distinguished. And then we, I said we compactify that in some way. And the way that we do so um, is we're going to enlarge this to allow not just points on the boundary of a disk, but trees of disks with boundary mark points. Um, so KR bar is defined to be uh, stable trees of disks with um, R plus 1 boundary mark points. Up to isomorphism. <clears throat> and all I mean when I say stable is I mean each of the disks in this tree has to have um, at least three special points on the boundary, where special means either marked or nodal. Um, and so that, that's how you can define KR bar as a set. Um, but it remains to topologize it. So if you have you know, this tree of disks and then this other tree of disks, how in the world are you going to be able to say whether they're close to each other? Um, and uh, one way to do so is by using cross ratios. Um, So what I mean by that is um, let's fix three indices i less than j less than k between 1 and r. And let's do the following construction. We'll start off with kr bar. And now we're going to forget all of the mark points except for the i, the j, the k, and the output. And you, know, you have to check that this is well defined. But I claim that that gives you a map from kr bar to k3 bar which, as we saw before, is just a closed interval. Um, and what this map looks like is the following. So let's represent our point in kr bar as r real numbers. So we're going to get that by saying um, that r numbers on the r points on the real line is the same thing as r plus 1 points on the circle with one of them distinguished. And um, under this composition of maps, the image is going to be xk minus xi over xj minus xi. OK, um, great. And um, it turns out that if you package all of these cross ratio maps together, so you look at all possible three tuples ijk, we're going to actually get an inclusion of kr bar into uh, a big product of intervals. Uh, and because this is an inclusion, we can use that. I mean, even if it weren't, but we're going to use this to induce a topology on the associahedron. And by the way, with this topology, kr bar is the closure of kr. So that's pleasant. Um, and um, it turns out, moreover, that uh, that you can give kr bar the structure of a stratified space, um, where when I say stratified space, I mean something purely topological. Um, in fact, it's a in fact it's a manifold with corners, but I won't talk about that. So let me just credit this proposition to everyone who might have a claim on it: Lean Mumford, Gruten Dieck Knudsen, uh, Fulton McPherson and uh, McDuff-Zolomon. 
So the proposition is that um, the associahedra are compact stratified spaces. Perhaps I should have said Tamari and Stashef too. And um, the post set which indexes those strata, um, by which I mean the post set which is in bijection with the strata and specifies when one stratum is contained in the closure of another stratum. So I'll call that post set I. And it's equal to the uh, stable rooted ribbon trees with R leaves. So stable means every vertex has valence at least three. Rooted means one vertex is distinguished. Ribbon means that for every vertex, the incoming edges have a preferred ordering. Uh, you know what leaves mean. Um, and then I need to tell you what the, the post set relation is. And um, it's defined by saying that it's generated by some moves, which are going to uh, take you down in this post set. So um, what's this move? Let's say that we're looking at some particular stab stable rooted ribbon tree, and we look at some particular vertex and its incoming edges. Say that there are k of them. So this is just some little piece of one of the stable rooted ribbon trees. Um, and we're going to select l consecutive edges and um, do the following surgery. sort of pull off those L edges. And we declare that the resulting tree is less than the tree we started with. And that's how less than is generated. OK. Um, any questions? So the reason that I've mentioned this is because uh, we're going to use a similar procedure to get the topology on the two associahedra. Yeah. I'm guessing this somehow is giving you the fact that when you write down the A infinity relations, you're applying this operation to some middle block of things, and then you're applying it to the rest? Yes, that's right. Um, and I, I guess I should say that the way that you go from a tree like this to one of the strata is you just say that tree corresponds to the stratum where um, each of the vertices is replaced by a disk and each of the edges is replaced by um, a node between uh, the two adjacent disks. <clears throat> so how about the two associahedra? So, uh, so like I said, we'll mimic the same procedure. Um, I'm not going to write down exactly what the definition of the two associahedron is as a set, because it would get us into some combinatorial weeds. Um, but I'll say that as a set, the two associahedron is defined to be um, certain trees of quilted disks. Uh, sorry, quilted spheres. <coughs> quilted spheres. Um, I will tell you roughly how you get the topology. So to get the topology, we're going to mimic this cross-ratio construction. Um, but it's more complicated. And the reason it's more complicated is that you can think of this cross-ratio construction as you say, well, there's one one-dimensional associahedron, K3 bar. And we're going to consider all of the forgetful maps down to that associahedron and put them all together. For the two associahedra, there's actually essentially four one-dimensional uh, two associahedra. And I'll tell you what they are. There's W100 bar. There's W3 bar. W20 bar. And W11 bar.
Um, and if you want to get an inclusion of, of a general two associohedron into Euclidean space, um, you need to use all of the four resulting types of cross ratios. Um, but the claim is that if you do so, if you consider all possible instances of these four types of cross ratios, you get an inclusion of W n bar into a big product of intervals. And that's how you get a topology. So theorem, with respect to this topology, Wn bar, the two associohedron, can be given a stratified structure. And the, the post set that indexes the strata is, uh, well, tree pairs of type n. And, um, and these tree pairs are, are what I'm about to tell you about. OK. Um, right. What's the stability condition? The stability condition is that if you have a sphere with at least two seams, then it must have at least a total of at least one mark point. Um, and if you have a sphere with exactly one seam, then it must have at least um, two mark points in addition to the output. Ah, OK, what are the isomorphisms? Yeah, yeah. Um, isomorphisms are translations and dilations when you view them from the point of view of, of C with vertical lines. Um, and when I say translation and dilation, I mean common translation and dilation of all of the data. <clears throat> OK, um, so tree pairs. Uh, this is the, like I said, this is the. Um, the elements of the post set that indexes the strata of the two sociohedra. Um, and uh, I'm not going to write up the definition because you'd fall asleep, but um, I'll define it by example. Um, and I'm going to start with an observation of Tamarkins, which is sort of key to the um, the, the flavor of the two sociohedra, and in particular, the tree pairs. Um, uh, and it's a little ahistorical because 1998 was 15, 17 years before anyone said it to a sociohedron. But anyway, um, let's look at W200 bar and let's consider a certain degeneration. So we start off in the interior. So we're looking at a sphere with three seams and two mark points on the left seam. And we're going to let these three um, seams come together. Uh, and, and we're going to say that the mark points aren't going to simultaneously collide as that, as that seam collision happens. So as it turns out, we get a co-dimension 1 um, de degeneration. And the limit looks like this. So the three circles fuse, and um, three bubbles sprout off, each of which has one mark point on the left seam. And now his observation is, let's look at the width between the, the left circle and the middle one on the top bubble. Call that A1. Similarly, between the middle and the right circle, B1. And same for the bottom circle. Call those widths A2 and B2. Then his observation is, well, um, the ratios of A1 to B1 and A2 to B2, those are equal. The reason for that being that these two bubbles were produced as the three circles on the original sphere collided. Um, and the ratio of A1 over B1, respectively A2 over B2, is gotten just by looking at the, the relative rates at which those circles collided. Um, so they come from the same relative rates, so these two ratios had better be the same. Um, and the, the gist of this is that these two bubbles that have sprouted are talking to each other. There is a constraint between 
um, the separation between seams on these two bubbles. That would also be codimension one, um, but uh, you 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 can't. How do you say this? You can't factor this degeneration as two circles come together and then two circles and then the remaining two circles come together. Um, if you did that, then what you'd be getting is something a little bit different. So instead of instead of this bubble, you'd be getting a bubble that looked like that. Um, so you'll have to take my word for it that it's co-dimension one. You see that also on the regular system either, right? When you have three points bubbling up. And yeah, you could think about it like that. That's right. When you have three points coming together um, uh, at commensurate speed, then that degeneration is co-dimension one. Um, right, so let me, let me define these tree ratios by one example. Um, so let's, let's work inside of W200 bar. Um, and uh, let's start off in the interior. So we're going to start off exactly with Tamarkin's degeneration. Um, and I'll tell you what tree pair this corresponds to. So a tree pair consists of two trees, with one of them corresponding to the um, configuration of quilted spheres, and the other tree being a sort of auxiliary datum which tracks coherences between um, seam positions. So in this case, the, the tree pair looks like this. Here's the top tree. We have three solid edges, um, and there's, a, there's two dashed edges which come off the left solid edge. And um, what's going on is um, solid edges correspond to seams. So that reflects the fact that the, the sphere here has three seams, so three solid edges. Um, dashed edges correspond to either edges or mark points. Uh, sorry, to either nodal points or mark points. Um, and the reason that we have two dashed edges on the leftmost solid edge is that there's two mark points on the leftmost circle. A nodal point is an attachment point between two spheres. A mark oh, point so is. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and in this case, the, I mean, there's no coherences amongst strip widths to enforce. So the, the, the bottom tree doesn't have much information, but anyway, there it is. And there's a map from the top one to the bottom one, which is just the obvious identification of solid edges. OK, um, so now let's look at Tamarkin's degeneration. All right, so this time, um, the, the seam tree is not going to do anything interesting, but the bubble tree will. So now the base component has one seam. So we start off with one solid edge. Um, it has two nodal points on it where other spheres attach. So we have two dashed edges. And those components that are attached along that original seam each have three seams. And the left seam on each of these bubbles has one mark point. So we get that as our bubble tree. Uh, both types of edges have a preferred cyclic ordering because seams can't pass through each other um, and mark points also can't pass through each other. Okay, and let's consider one more degeneration. This is also going to be co-dimension one. Um, so let's say that the top and the, or sorry that on the on the top bubble the middle and the left seams collide. Um, now, because of this equality between ratios I was mentioning a minute ago, that forces the same kind of thing to happen on the bottom bubble. Um, so we'll get the following tree of quilted spheres. OK. So we have a main component on which sit two bubbles. And on each of these bubbles, it's a further bubble. Um, and um, I'll draw the tree pair over here. Um, and this time, um, the, the seam tree, the one down below, is doing something interesting. Um, so because the um, middle and left seams on the top bubble are coming together, uh, that's forcing that 
the, the symmetry degenerates in this fashion, um, which, which, uh, which in turn forces um, this sort of degeneration of the bottom bubble. Um, so I'm not going to say anything more precise about these tree pairs than that, um, just to claim that uh, you need this sort of structure uh, on your index post set if you want to capture these coherences between seam positions. Okay. Um, uh, and, and I'll also say maybe that, that there's, a, there's a formula in terms of um, the tree pair about what the dimension of the corresponding stratum is. And furthermore, an expression, a sort of decomposition of any given stratum into a fiber product of, uh, of the interior Wn for lower n. OK, um, so the thing I want to finish off with is a few words about the operad-like structure on these things. Um, and uh, you know, even if you're not an operad nut, you shouldn't tune out, because uh, this is really important. I was saying at the beginning that the algebraic flavor of the Fukai category comes from the operatic structure of the domain moduli spaces. And therefore, you'd expect that the coherences amongst the algebraic, the coherences amongst the maps we want to produce between Fukai categories using two associahedra should come from some kind of operat like structure on the two associahedra. OK, um, great. So uh, I claim that the two associahedra aren't an operad, or at least I've thought about them a lot, and I don't think they are, um, but that they are something that I'm calling a uh, two operad relative to the associahedra. And here's what I mean by that. So can everyone see this board? Yeah. Um, so there, there's maps from the two associahedra to the associahedra. And here's an illustration of one of these things. So we start out with um, W200 bar, which is a pentagon. Um, and we're going to get a map to KR, where R is equal to the number of subscripts of my two associahedra. And so we're going to get a map to K3 bar, which is an interval. And what we're doing is we're, we're um, starting with a point in my two associahedron and forgetting everything except for the, um, the uh, positions of the seams. Um, so in this case, here's what it looks like. Uh, in the interior of this two associahedron, you have this sphere with three, three, three seams and two mark points on the left one. Forget everything except for the, the horizontal positions of these three seams. And that's giving you a map down to uh, the interior of K3. Um, and this picture shows which faces map down to which faces in the associahedron. Um, and I've told you this because um, this is a necessary piece of the data in a relative to operad. And I'm not going to write down the definition of relative to operad because I definitely don't have time and you don't want to see it. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate it with an example, which I think expresses basically exactly what I mean by this structure. Um, and maybe I'll point out for the operad nuts that, um, so this is, I think, some new notion, but that when you take the ordinary operad you're working over to be, as, to be the associative operad, you recover Batanen's definition of two operad. So, um, Maybe first I will remind you that um, the, the operatic structure on the associahedra looks like this. We're going to start with kr bar and ks bar, take their product and map that to kr plus s minus 1 bar. Um, and you get one such map for every i between 1 and r. Yes, forgetting the mark points, forgetting the whole structure of the tree of spheres. Um, OK, so the idea of this operad map is we're thinking of, uh, of kr as an r airy, as a space of r airy operations. And same thing for ks bar. And we're feeding um, an operation in ks bar into the ith input of kr bar. So the way th this map will look is we take a point in kr bar 
and a point in Ks bar. And we just stick the output of Ks bar into the ith input of Kr bar, where I'm using output and input just to mean the distinguished and undistinguished mark points. So the output looks like this. So we want to do something like this for the two associate hedra. Um, so how's that going to work? Let's say that the analog of kr bar we're going to say is maybe w um, 0, 3, 0, 1 bar. So that looks like this. And we want to feed points in other associate hedra into these three mark points. But we can't feed in just points in just any old two associahedron. Um, they all have to be in, in two associahedra with the same number of subscripts. And furthermore, their images in the associahedron under the um, map I wrote down on the far right board have to be the same. This is Demarcus observation. This is what now? This is Demarcus observation. No, this is my construction. No, but I mean, <coughs> the requirement you just uttered. Yes, yes, is that's right. For the that's right. That's exactly right. Um, OK, so maybe I'll feed in W213 bar and W101 bar and W010 bar. And I want to take not the product, but the fiber product over K3 bar. Um, OK, and now this is going to look like just what you expect. So that gives you some idea of the relative two operatic structure of the two associahedra. I'll stop there. <laughs>